Jonah Lehrer is with us. He's author of the new book, Imagine How Creativity Works, also author of the book, How We Decide, which I just finished reading, actually. Uh, Jonah, great to talk to you. Um, the, book, the book is fascinating, and there's so much in it that I'll just try to focus on a couple of things that I think will be interesting to our audience. One of the great themes in the book is the idea that creativity, something that people maybe often assume you either have it or you don't, can actually yeah. be a set of skills that people can learn. That's probably counterintuitive to a lot of people. Give us a sense of how that works. It is. I mean, I think you know one of the tragedies of the way we've been thinking about creativity is we assume it's an all-or-nothing phenomenon, that it's this rare gift, and unless you've got privileged access to the muses, you are just out of luck. The science, the good news is, the science is very clear. The creativity is actually universal. doesn't mean we're all going to be Bob Dylan or Pablo Picasso. So it's got a distribution. We all learn to get and by learning how the mind works. Um, there's this great line of T.S. Eliot's, which is that bad poets are conscious when they should be unconscious and unconscious when they should be conscious. That, in a sense, they get their mind exactly backwards. And I think that's a mistake a lot of us make. So one thing I wanted to do in this book is to show people how creativity actually unfolds in those three pounds of meat inside their head so they could learn to get the most out of it. And so what are some of the things, the way people can kind of uh, uh, craft a sense of creativity? I mean, what can people actually do? And, and does this extend also to the arts? I mean, like, for example, I just don't think I can draw or paint anything to save my life. But potentially, it, it, could, I, could I train myself to have creativity to do that? You know, you could, you could train yourself to get better. It would still involve lots of work and talent. You'd have to put in those 10,000 hours of practice, plus or minus 5,000 hours. So, you know, we can make ourselves more creative. It, that still doesn't mean we don't have to work hard at it. But, you know, there are some lessons that I think can make us all more likely to have good ideas. So one of the things that was most surprising to me is when you're stuck on a really, really hard problem, a seemingly impossible problem, it's really important to find a way to get relaxed. You know, I think we live in this day and age where we assume that when you're stuck, you need to drink a triple espresso, chug some Red Bull, <laughs> to chain yourself to your desk. But that turns out to be exactly backwards. You'll be focused, but you'll just be focused on the problem. You'll be making no progress. Instead, people are much more likely to actually find the answer, to have one of those moments of insight when they take a break, when they go for a walk, when they take a long hot shower, when they play some ping pong, that the answer only arrives once we stop searching for it. There's this wonderful line of Einstein's that creativity is the residue of wasted time. Sometimes next time you get an epiphany, you can sign. So those scientific lessons that has really changed my own creative process. So um, I think also one of, the, one of the kind of conventional wisdoms is that the idea of the brainstorm session has become really, really popular as a way to kind of foster creativity and get new ideas out there. But it turns out that either because of some of the kind of internal dynamics and interpersonal dynamics of those sessions, uh, that, that actually may not be one of those ways to foster creativity. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Brainstorming is probably the most widely implemented creativity technique in the world. It was first proposed by Alex Osborne. He's, uh, he was an ad executive at BBDO, the huge ad agency. He's like the Don Draper of his day. And in a series of best-selling business business books, he outlined this technique called brainstorming. The very first rule and the most important rule of brainstorming is no criticism allowed. That he assumed the imagination was meek and shy, and if his word about being criticized, it'll just clam up and won't be able to free associate at all. Unfortunately, brainstorming doesn't work, and this has been shown in study after study over the last 50 years, that people actually come up with more ideas and better ideas when they work by themselves than when they brainstorm in a group. Now, the reason brainstorming doesn't work returns us to the very first rule of brainstorming, which is thou shalt not criticize, because studies show that when groups engage in debate and dissent, when they constructively criticize each other, they actually come up with far more ideas, and those ideas are rated as more original and more useful. That, that, that we've for so long assumed that you know, the imagination runs from criticism, but it turns out it actually allows us to dig deeper. It's invigorating. It means we're surprised that we're actually really paying attention. And so for the first time, we're able to dig below the superficial surface of the imagination, and that's when, thing, that's when things get interesting. So you know, the larger lesson is we really do find our best ideas once we stop pretending that every idea is a good one. So this, this really gets back to a political issue I talk about a lot, which is 
the, the media tendency to kind of give every absurd notion equal footing when, when debating a topic, um, yeah. which I actually don't think is really a valid, a valid strategy. So what you're actually saying is that it, brainstorming can even open up the, the discussion to ideas that are either, uh, I don't know what, I don't want to use the term not valid, but maybe not really going towards solving the problem at hand. Is that the yeah. idea? That's exactly right. You don't want to waste time on useless ideas, number one. So the brainstorming is also just infinite. But it also tells us that when we just stick to this premise of every idea is worth discussing, then we never really get anywhere. You know, we don't, we don't get somewhere interesting. That It turns out most free associations are pretty superficial. So if I ask you to free associate on blue, I can predict with a high degree of accuracy that your first answer will be green, followed by ocean, followed by sky. Maybe you'll say Joni Mitchell, maybe Miles Davis. If you're really creative, you'll talk about genes and Smurfs, but nothing too surprising, you know? And that's because our free associations are bound by language and language is full of cliches. So the way we get beyond those cliches is by actually engaging in debate and dissent, by, by having an honest and open conversation. And that's when people start really listening to each other, right? And isn't that the point of coming together in the first place? Talk a little bit about this fascinating story of the bartender who thinks like a chemist. And I'm particularly interested in that because my producer does a little bartending. He moonlights as a bartender sometimes. Oh, good for him. And so so talk, talk about that story because it's fascinating. This is the story of Don Lee. He's the head bartender at the Mufuka chain at this point. Um, and, and, you know, for a long time, he was just obsessed with finding those perfect cocktail recipes, you know, that making a martini better than anyone else. But at a certain point, he realized, you know what? I want to invent my own drink. And so then he gets all experimental. He comes up with several drinks that are just total disasters. But eventually, he starts pioneering this technique called fat washing, in which you you basically sweat lots of bacon. So you cook off lots of bacon, and then you cover that bacon with bourbon. You refrigerate it for a few hours or a few days, depending on exactly how strong you want the bacon flavor to be. And then because of the chemical properties of alcohol and fat, the two never mix. So you can just skim off all the fat. And then you're left with this fat-free booze that tastes and smells just like breakfast meat. <laughs> it, you know, it's not to everyone's taste. It's not, you know, not everyone's going to like bacon bourbon. But if you like it, you're going to love it. It's going to make you drool, just the smell in your glass. And in the book, I talk about this as really an example of outsider creativity. I think we live in a day and age where we assume that when you're trying to come up with something new, it's always better to give that problem to an expert on the inside, to someone who knows more about that than anyone else. But that often turns out to be a big mistake, that, that, that in a sense, knowledge comes with blind spots and that people who know a little bit less can often see more. That because they're less trapped by their old assumptions, by, by the conventional wisdom, by their investment in the status quo, they can actually come up with more original ideas. All right. Well, my producer and, just oh, made a note to try mixing deer meat with vodka. We'll see how that goes. Oh, God, that sounds horrible. But <laughs> I forgot to mention that, that what allowed John Lee to actually do this is that he had no formal training as a bartender. He came from an engineering computer science background. He just loved booze, he loved playing with booze. And I think it was, on the one hand, the fact that he really knew more about chemistry bourbon that allowed him to come up with bacon bourbon. It's, it's, it really is incredible. The book is Imagine How Creativity Works. We've been speaking with Jonah Lehrer. Unfortunately, we didn't have the best connection, but it's still great to talk to you, Jonah. And uh, congratulations on the book and good luck with the tour. Thank you and apologies about the connection. <laughs>